So I chose this topic. So I wanted to sort of make a link between Wilde, the famous Dance of the Seven Veils, and the very well-known French performer, Louis Fuller, who you might not have heard of, but who was very much seen as the apotheosis of Art Nouveau. And uh, Louis Fuller was one of the first to sort of dance the role of Salome in terms of, of the, the spectacle of Art Nouveau at the Folie Bergère. So this is the poster for 1895. And then next to the poster is this wonderful lamp by Raoul Larche, which has tried to capture the effect of her dress, which you'll see later was something of a tour de force in its own right. So this is just to, to remind you of where we are in terms of wild progression. We've gone through the young wild, the sunflowers, the peacock feathers and patience. We've had a bit of a era in the doldrums in the late 1880s and now Wilde has come back onto the scene firstly with Dorian Gray and then with Salome. So you can see Dorian Gray was written in July 1890 and October 1891 is Salome and you could say that Wilde created two of the most potent images of the fin de siècle and decadence. Uh, the beautiful Ben Barnes here in the role of Dorian who obviously you know in the picture of Dorian Gray remains beautiful while his painting rots. And Salome becomes the archetypal femme fatale of the 1890s. The ingenue who when she cannot achieve her goal, uh, acquiring uh, the head of John the Baptist on a platter instead. And uh, importantly, uh, Salome, although written in October 1891, is not illustrated uh, by Beardsley until 1894, and this is the uh, front page. Uh, so you will know that Beardsley and Wilde's relationship was, was never an easy one. I always blame it on their egos. And the illustrations for Salome were idiosyncratic. They were very much the work of Beardsley, and sometimes they don't seem to relate, perhaps as much as they should do, uh, to the text. Beardsley punted for the job. He wasn't directly commissioned uh, by the Bodley head, but he had an article, it was almost like an advertorial uh, for his work in the newly founded studio. In fact, this first volume, volume number one, of the studio has become iconic for containing this article about Beardsley. And he included this image of a Salome, rather beautifully tinted green, um, in the original, uh, the head of John the Baptist, and then the uh, famous quote underneath about kissing John the Baptist, but only in death. And it was this um, uh, advertorial that secured for Beardsley the commission to illustrate uh, Salome. In the famous photograph, you can see again Wilde describing Beardsley's physique, a monstrous orchid, as you know, who always had fragile health but from childhood due to tuberculosis, that he dies nearly 25. A face like a silver hatchet and green grass hair. And he's in the guise here of the famous gargoyle, the uh, sort of vampire from Notre Dame. So Beardsley and Wilde were able to draw on many previous sources, particularly for Beardsley, the art of Gustave Moreau uh, would have been very appealing. He is one of the symbolists of the mid 19th century. And the traditional way to, to show Salome was really with the head of John the Baptist on the platter, having achieved her goal. And in this image by Gustave Moreau, we can see a rather young, innocent, possibly virginal uh, Salome uh, not able to even look at the, the aura of, around the head of John the Baptist. His, obviously his sainthood, very obvious. But Morrow is going to develop a very different type of a Salome, a dancing one, as you can see here in an early sketch for his very famous painting. Now this famous painting would have inspired both Beardsley and Wilde. And we know that uh, Wilde might well have seen La Apparition, which you can see uh, here on the right hand side of the screen. So this is the first in effect of a sequence of almost 20 paintings uh, by Gustave Moreau, leading symbolist of the mid 19th century um, in Paris. 
because the first image shows Salome dancing up before Herod. She's up on her tippy toes. And I did like the fact that her pranker has come with her. And then he develops an even more potent image of the apparition with the disembodied, decapitated head of John the Baptist floating um, in the ether, uh, with now, as you can see, um, Herod in the background. It was this painting, dates to 1876, that actually came uh, to London. It was bought by Leon Gauchez, um, who is in fact a Belgian art dealer, and shown at the first Grosvenor Gallery. Now we know that Wilde went to the Grosvenor Gallery, he wrote his first piece of art criticism and uh, launched his career as an art historian stroke critic. But we're not absolutely certain that he saw the apparition because he didn't write about it in his critique. But he would have had to work hard to avoid it because it was actually hung in the main East Gallery alongside works by Whistler and Burne Jones, which we know uh, that he critiqued. And this was unusual because it was a watercolour, so it wasn't hidden away with the other watercolours. So I think we can be fairly certain that Wilde would have seen the apparition at this point. Uh, if you look on the internet, there's lots of sites that suggest that Wilde would have seen this painting in 1884, but I'm not actually sure how he would have achieved that. By that stage, most of the uh, famous images were either in private hands or still in Gustav Moreau's studio, like this version that you see here in the Musée Gustav Moreau, a very good place to visit the next time you're lucky enough to get to Paris, a beautifully, beautifully preserved artist studio. But yet another version of it, as you can see, 19 oil paintings, six watercolours and over 150 uh, drawings. And Wilde would have known about it not only physically, perhaps by seeing it at the Grosvenor Gallery, but also because the, the painting gained agency uh, through uh, Huisman's famous Ouroboros, where there's a long description of it. Uh, there's a quote here, the dreadful head glows eerily, bleeding all the while, so that clots of dark red form at the ends of hair and beard. Graphically, as you can see, um, illustrating the painting. Again here uh, in the apparition, Herod in the background, a very bejeweled body and I think that's perhaps interesting how, it, I mean, if you've noticed, but she's shed her clothes along the evolution of Gustav Moro's apparition and now she's simply uh, naked but for her jewels and has gained, has come with her leopard. The, the main character of Orobor again describes her very graphically, weird and superhuman figure he had dreamed of in her quivering breasts heaving belly, tossing thighs. She was now revealed as the symbol incarnate of old world vice. Now, please note the heaving belly because Beardsley, of course, will envisage at Salome's dance as Egyptian belly dance. So it's quite interesting to have that direct reference in Arabor. There are other sources that Wad would have looked to to create his uh, version of Salome, and undoubtedly he would have known as Stefan Malame's uh, Herodia, uh, where we get again this very complicated mixture of virgin and whore. The horror of my virginity delights me and would envelop me in the terror of my tresses. That's a classic fin de siècle trope, the snake-like tresses of the fan patel that entwine around a man and squeeze all the power out of him. That by night, in violet or reptile, I might feel the white and glimmering radiance of thy frozen fire. Thou art chaste and diest of desire, white night of ice and of the cruel snow. I love that, diest of desire. Uh, Flaubert was also attracted and wrote about Salome in Three Tales, which again we know that Wilde was familiar with Herodias. Uh, it was Walter Pater that introduced Wilde uh, to Flaubert. And Flaubert was, I think, attracted to the story again because he had seen a very unusual base relief on the, the tympanum of Rouen Cathedral. The tympanum is the bit that goes over the door, where Salome dances on her hands. So Flaubert's Salome was more of an acrobat than a dancer. Um, but we're not quite sure what Wilde had in mind for his Salome, because the line, the dance of the seven veils, is left wide open to interpretation. 
It's a very unusual uh, image uh, to find on any cathedral. And you can see, I've got a close up of Salome dancing on her hands. So you can see that there were quite a few sources, both for Wilde and Beardsley, to look back to in terms of evolving their own version of Salome. I'm not going to show you every single image uh, from Beardsley's famous uh, illustrated edition, just the ones that really relate to the concept of Salome and her dance. So the woman in the moon is the frontis, and I wanted to include this because obviously this has got an image of Wilde as the woman in the moon. And one of the main differences in his interpretation of Salome are all these interconnections with the moon. And then on the uh, contents page, you can see uh, that there are references to hitherto suppressed. So quite a few of the images were suppressed by John Lane. And this is the complete edition. Uh, Beardsley's short life did not stop him from evolving very rapidly. In fact, every single project that he worked on, he appears to have reinvented himself. He works through many different styles. The Mort d'Arthur, he clearly opted very logically for a pre-Raphaelite style. And Beardsley almost pastiches Burne Jones sometimes. For Salome, he adopted Japonism. There was another wave of interest in all things Japanese in the 1890s, thanks to Samuel Bing um, in Paris. And uh, perhaps he felt that the Japanese element sort of fitted the Orientalism in the broadest sense of the word. But the, another very obvious Japanese and uh, aesthetic link was Whistler. So the peacock dress was inspired by Beardsley visiting Frederick Leyland's famous Peacock Dining Room, which you see here. You might have been lucky earlier in the year before lockdown to see this at the V&A, where there's a mod there was a modern installation uh, showing the Peacock Room collapsing under the weight of time and decadence. How apt, um, considering it becomes um, an exemplar of aesthetic uh, taste. And the two uh, fighting peacocks, they're supposed to be Frederick Leyland and Whistler, by the way, um, are appraised, obviously, in the peacock dress of Beardsley's uh, wonderful illustration to Salome. I mentioned the Japanese prints. We know that Beardsley had his own collection. They were very easy to see. Most connoisseurs had their own examples. Uh, the V&A had already built up a very large collection. So this uh, example here was in the V&A by 1886. I chose this particular one because you can see some obvious synergies to the black cape, the sort of bulky uh, dress that she's wearing, the very elaborate um, headdress, the flatness, the bold colours, the lack of perspective, these were all things that Western artists found fascinating or fascinated by the Japanese print and its different approach. And we mustn't forget that Salome had a huge impact. Um, I know that it was uh, sent to Brussels to be shown in the, one of the famous avant-garde exhibitions held by La Libre Esthetique. So it was one of the works that helped to disseminate the new art style. Here's a direct correlation. This is the famous poster by Charles Remy Mackintosh uh, with Margaret MacDonald, Francis MacDonald and Herbert McNair. They make up the Glasgow Four. You can see a very obvious synergy here between Margaret in fact modeling for the poster and the meeting of John the Baptist with Salome. I always joke and say, he's had a bad hair day and has just been to Versace. And I do love the fact that Salome is about to eat him. She appears to have teeth uh, coming out of her elaborate coiffure. But the important thing is that the disembodiment of these figures very much inspires the spook school of Glasgow. And these iconic posters were actually shown in Samuel Bing's La Maison La Nouveau, gives its name to the entire new art movement in France. And that famous shop opened in 1895. So Art Nouveau was very much an international style. So Beardsley suffered, as we saw at the beginning, from censorship. So here's one of the censored images. And what gets censored, of course, is this appendage. Uh, because one figure was undressed, the little drawing was suppressed. It was unkind, but never mind. 
that's it all was for the best. So this is Enter Herodias, again with the Whistlerian peacock feathers. And the figure here, which is a sort of Pyrrho Pyrrhette spray, obviously looks like a rather grotesque um, uh, fetus, which was one of Beardsley's sort of psychological hang-ups, again, because he felt that his illness was sort of uh, hereditary. Then down the bottom, Lane missed the candles, which are very obviously phallic, and Wilde clutching Salome in the corner is the jester, but with the owl on his head. Then the eyes of Herod also has a rather cruel um, pastiche of Wilde, looking a little fleshly. And then uh, we have the stomach dance itself. So as I mentioned, uh, Wilde leaves the whole dance open to various interpretations. But the actual stage directions are interesting. The dance of seven veils. Where on earth would he have got that idea from? Well, one idea is that he was looking at very ancient myths. There's one involving Ishtar, where we have a protagonist that descends through seven gates of hell and has to remove a veil at each gate. The idea is that each stripping of each layer will reveal truth at the end. Or he might have read the poem, The Daughter of Herodias by Arthur O'Shaughnessy, where again we get lots of references to veils. She freed and floated on the air, her arms above dim veils that hid her bosom's charms. Clearly that doesn't apply here. The bosoms are very graphically revealed. The veils fell round her like thin, coiling mist, shot through by topaz suns and amethysts. But Beardsley clearly opts for the belly dance option, which was suddenly uh, the talk of the town, uh, largely thanks to the Chicago World Fair of 1893, which was like a, a platform for new technology, but also new uh, cultural events. Typical tongue-in-cheek comments of Wilde's for Aubrey, for the only artist who beside myself knows what the dance of the seven veils is and can see that invisible dance, almost again implying that it was open uh, to wide interpretation. I love the guitarist down the bottom of going slightly demonic. So there are many images of Salome, not quite so many of her dancing, mostly with John the Baptist and that decapitated head, as you'll see in a minute. But I wanted to show you this one in particular by Georges Orochegros, French, um, because you can see this makes it much more Roman. It's quite a crossover between Oriental decadence and the decadence of the Romans, which was a very popular topic throughout the 19th century, thanks to Bulwer Lytton's infamous novel, um, which was uh, all about, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire and uh, the last days of Pompeii. And it was literally one of the best-selling novels of the era. And our Salome here, as you can see, is indeed dancing with veils, but also wearing harem pants. Um, her, uh, her breast covered again with very elaborate jeweling. And her audience is an interesting mixture again of Oriental and Roman characters. And the architecture is very obviously Roman. So I'm trying to emphasize here how you've got to somehow mash together the way in which artists very Eurocentrically looked at the Orient uh, or the Middle East in this instance and also were able to wrap that up into the decadence of the Romans, more of that later. So artists interpreted, interpreted Salome in, in a myriad number of ways. So Armand Point here, again, another French artist. Now it's called the Dance of the Seven Veils, but that could easily have been applied retrospectively, um, which was pretty common, in fact, in the 19th century. And as you can see, it's said to date to around about 1890, and, his style me appears to be medieval, the pre Raphaelite version, as you can see, the sort of medieval tower, uh, and her dress could almost be Italian Renaissance. And the image by Musha, again, 1897, you can see here again this emphasis all the time on uh, the exotic. I think that would be the best way to describe it. So the end, or the climax, I should say, of uh, Salome. Alla Beardsley is the head being presented on the platter as the dancer's reward and the climax itself uh, kissing the lips of John the Baptist but only in death 
a reworking of the original illustration in the studio, but now minus uh, the inscription. And what you might not have noticed is that in the dancer's reward, this is an arm coming up, some sort of Nubian slave holding up the head of John the Baptist, uh, which obviously is a very gory spectacle um, and may owe something to Gustave Moreau's rendering this head with all the dripping blood. So artists absolutely loved this idea, this sort of lascivious moment of uh, Salome achieving her goal and love consummated but only in death. Uh, Lucien Leve Dermot was a very famous French symbolist artist. This is as late as 1910 and therefore would be after the uh, Maud Allen uh, spectacle and obviously after the opera by Strauss, but more of that later. This is Lovis, Lovis Corinth. Very Hollywood image of Salome, 1900 in date. Uh, number two, so it shows you again how he was attracted to the theme. I've loved, always sort of loved the way she's fingering with these bejeweled uh, fingers here, the head of John the Baptist, whose legs rather alarmingly are going in the other direction at the bottom. It's a, it's a particularly, I think, disquieting image. Uh, here by Pierre Bonneau, at Salome in traditional role, you know, gloating over the head, uh, bejeweled and uh, wearing a snake in her headdress and also a snake on her arm and sitting on a tiger skin. They love putting women on any big cat. The implications are, ladies, that like leopards, we change, never change our spots. And essentially we are uh, potentially all femme fatales. Uh, the Leopold Schmaltzler, I mean, it's Schmaltz, isn't it? Literally lives up to its name. Again, 1907, post Maud Allen, just a bejeweled body. I love the peacock feathers, the, again, the rings on the fingers, the snakes going up the arms, and the look of sort of manic uh, pleasure on her face at the bloodied head of John the Baptist. Now, it's said that the Francois Stuck version of Salome was actually based on Maud Allen, that she went into his studio and modelled for him in the nude. Uh, and this there might be an urban myth, uh, because although Maud Allen performed all over the world, I, it's not the sort of thing that she normally does. And in fact, I'm showing you one of the photographs that um, uh, Francois Stuck used, so that was his usual modus operandi either working from a professional model or using photographs. And this is one of his other versions of Salome here uh, being modeled. The famous one of 1906, again, is said to have been inspired by the opera being performed in Munich. And I've always found this image particularly disquieting uh, because of the black uh, servant in the background and then Salome dancing uh, with all her jewels in the foreground. Which brings me to back to Loey Fuller, uh, who certainly was one of the earliest to dance the concept of the Seven Veils um, in March 1895. So this doesn't imply that she was performing the play, but she was exploiting the, the newfound um, agency that Salome now gave dancers, this sort of idea of a, uh, a femme fatale who enraptures uh, through bodily movement and, of course, costume. The photograph of her could either relate to the 1895 performance or when she reprises it in 1907. And the official first Salome to perform Wilde's play is the following year in Paris again at Lina Munter. So here is uh, uh, Louis Fuller in the guise, the new creation of a Salome. Now, to choose an historical character to perform was a novelty for Louis Fuller. She arrives in Paris in 1892, uh, very successful already in America, perfecting her dance. Already many imitators, right the way across Europe, have performed what becomes known as her dance serpentina, also known as the skirt dance. You'll see why in a minute. And uh, she was an unlikely superstar. She was already nearly 30, and most dancers were thinking of retiring around that age. She wasn't anywhere near as beautiful as she appears on stage in real life. She was rather dumpy, uh, a little short, and uh, facially was not a great beauty. She didn't live up to her persona off the stage. She didn't have a, you know, a couture outfits. She looked rather shabby. 
She was habitually with her mother and lived 20 years with another woman, which I think we would therefore read today as a lesbian relationship. So there was always a very, very curious tension between Loey Fuller on stage and the Loey Fuller in real life. And you may not have heard of her, but she is very famous in France. So here is the recent film uh, where Soko dances the part of Loey Fuller. Lily Rose Depp takes on the role of Isadora Duncan, who I'm sure you have heard of, but it goes that way round. Louis Fuller, Isadora Duncan is her protégé, and they actually uh, toured together with uh, Isadora Duncan in the supporting role. So now I'm going to show you Soko recreating Louis Fuller's remarkable dance. So here she goes, and you can see that it's um, really all about the costume being held out on these gigantic batons. So here's a photograph to show you that we haven't made her up. You can see here how basically she didn't move. It was her arms that moved. And she swept across the stage, um, transforming, metamorphosizing into lots of different creatures. She could be a flower, a rose, or a pansy. She could be a butterfly or a bird. She could even be a snake. The performance lasted 45 minutes and essentially was a light show. So Stefan Malami, who wrote about her, said she was an interesting comp comp composition, an interesting amalgamation of art and technology. She was often referred to as the electric fairy. And many of the posters very much emphasize this electric light show that she comes to represent. These are two images of, uh, by Jules Chéret of Loïc Fuller at the Folie Bergère. And her first official performance, using her own name, uh, was November the 5th, 1892. And I, I'd love to know, anybody can find it, any reference that Wilde might have been to the Folie Bergère um, you know, when he was in Paris, any time after this date, obviously, to make a, a connection directly between Wild and Loewy Fuller. And this is a Stéphane Malame, again, emphasizing this combination of art and technology, the dizziness of soul made visible by an artifice. And the artifice wasn't just the dress held out on these batons. It was the use of the light so here is the dress. You can see this is a genuine um, period tinted film said to be of Louis Fuller. Sometimes difficult because there were so many imitators of the serpentine dance. But you can see again that it's very much about using your arms to move this amazing volume of silk around. And this is the patent to protect her costume. But she also had patents to protect her light show. So the butterfly dance, the serpent dance, she is at once an artistic intoxication and an industrial achievement. She blends with the rapidly changing colours which vary their limelight phantasmagoria, twilight and grotto, their emotional changes, delight, mourning, anger. So it was the ethereal nature of Louis Fuller's performance sort of abstract. So that may be the reason why when she tried to dance an historical character like Salome, it was a bit of a flop. You might have heard in my film clip that there's quite a lot of huffing and puffing coming from Sogo. And so, you know, that didn't work for the Parisian audiences who wanted this ethereal butterfly. They didn't want a sort of club hopping at Salome. So a lot of the posters very much emphasise the limelight. So here she is. This is a rather nice illustration showing how she's illuminated with limelight. Uh, there are coloured filters in this uh, circular wheel going round. Uh, there's uh, coloured filters up here as well. So the lights shone down in different directions and probably one from above. And she stood on a mirror or a piece of glass, again, to make it look as though, because the rest of the auditorium is in pitch dark to make it look as though she's almost floating um, in the ether and so this is a little diagram to show you uh, one of the patents that she took out to, to, took out to protect her hydraulic system because she could go up and down in the middle here raised up 
Uh, so again, she, she moved up and down, but not physically, she's actually moved up and down. The dress, the, you know, the whole thing is very static in terms of modern dance. Uh, mirrors all the way around, all those initials represent mirrors. You can see a little sketch up here of the light and the mirrors with the many, many lonely fullers. And then these are all the limelights, again, coming up through the floor. So you can see here what we mean about this uh, combination of art and industry. And remembering that this, you know, the, the Art Nouveau embraces the new technology. It's not like the arts and crafts movement. It really does want to have art that represents the new modernity. And so Loewy Fuller literally became the apotheosis of modernity. She was the modern woman. So here, two fantastic images again, uh, Jules Cheret and Pal, which was a, a nom de plume in effect. Again, emphasizing here the fire dance, you know, because it looked almost like sometimes she was literally on fire. Uh, these uh, show different dances, different guises, costumes. These photographs, as you'll see in a minute, are like carte de visite. I think they're more tourist than anything else. Uh, the serpent dance is on this side, and this is the butterfly dance. So here, firstly, is the serpent dance. You can see here what I mean about a sort of tourist memento, where Loey uh, is looking at the snake here, and we've got snakes all over her dress. And then this is the butterfly dance, but this is the studio photograph. And I think you can see what I mean about she wasn't perhaps as beautiful as you might imagine her to be in real life. Um, I love the butterfly in the middle of her forehead and on her dress. But in reality, this was what she actually wore on stage. And this particular photograph, she's clearly raised up on something. Otherwise, she's superhumanly tall, as you can see. And this sequence, and there are lots of sequences of Loewy dancing. She had a huge following. People would go to the Folie Bergère. Uh, it didn't matter what class you were. The Folie Bergère was suddenly full of toffs in their evening clothes. And, you know, um, the men all, you know, and women all beautifully kitted out, mingling with the working classes. It was, Loewy was a, a phenomenon that trans, transgressed or transformed a class divisions, dancing at the Holly Berger, it was, she was simply the talk of the town and everybody wanted to see her. So she was beloved by aristocrats who often invited her to come and perform in their homes. And uh, here she is, in fact, uh, dancing in a rather beautiful garden, really again, emphasizing the, the technology of her costume. Um, there's the butterfly element at the top. And again, one of these, fantastic staged photographs with the moon behind her again making me immediately think of Oscar Wilde's Salome and it was this that was believe it or not um, the inspiration uh, for the Eurovision Song Contest. This is Elena Nechevea singing the entry for Estonia at the 2018 Eurovision Song Contest. I think you've got a good idea of how impressive Loewy must have looked in 1900. Admittedly, not quite perhaps such a sophisticated light show, but how the sail-like costume, you know, reflected the lights and the mirrors and created this spectacular effect. She was immediately, uh, again, the talk, not just the talk of the town, but artists flocked to see her. So here is Toulouse the Drex version sketch of Loewy in, in full flight, 1893, and the uh, homolithograph again, very much bringing out. This is the pit down here with the orchestra, and here's Loewy dancing on the stage, and his image again, very much bringing out the limelight. This is uh, Colm and Moser, you know him from the Vienna Secession, with these plumes of loom li uh, limelight to either side, and her flight. And I love the Will Bradley. Many people think that this is Italy. It looks very light, doesn't it, his style? But you could say that Will Bradley, who illustrated the chapbook, was in effect America's uh, Aubrey Beardsley. So by the time we get to Paris 1900, everybody knows about Levy Fuller. This is the main entrance, the Port Binet. There were over 50 million visitors to Paris 1900, the largest World Fair we have ever enjoyed. Uh, 60 
six million, six million light bulbs used throughout the exhibition. And this is the Port Binet illuminated. For me to emphasize that really, you know, you can see how Loewy becomes the apotheosis of Art Nouveau. And she embodies the whole concept of the artificial sunlight as electric light was often referred to. And she was so successful by this stage that she had her own theater at Paris 1900. I love the poster. Again, has a Japanese to it, as you can see, even down to the uh, monogram down the bottom. And the um, famous theater of Louis Fuller was designed by Henri Sauvage, uh, very young. He's going to become very famous because he designed uh, Louis Marjorel's house in Nancy. Uh, in fact, he already he was already working on that. And uh, this is when Isadora Duncan comes on the scene and she's invited to tour with Fuller in 1902. I've always thought it looks like the spirit of the wind on the top. And it's at this point that Loewy is replicated on in everything from pottery, um, porcelain, lamps, you name it, they get Loewy Fullard. I particularly like this because it really emphasizes the iridescence of the butterfly wings. This is uh, Clément Massier. Uh, pottery. Uh, lamps, this is a, well first of all there's a figure, this one here, which replicates her arm movement is by Goldschneider and is ceramic. This however on the other side is a wonderful a patinated lamp by Raoul Lash, um, who designed two or three different versions of Louis Fuller. And they're not really lamps, they are what we refer to as illuminated sculptures. Don't even think you can afford one, they, they retail for about 75, 80,000 uh, pounds. And I've got several, you know, just to give you an idea that Raoul Lash, more than any other, I think, designer really captures the movement of her dress. And this is the, another version by him, again, where the dress is thrown up right over her head. It's the same lamp, sorry, illuminated sculpture, but from two different views. I love this one. Again, it could almost be the figurehead on a car, couldn't it? Again, spirit of the wind or speed. The sort of ice cream cone effect that she created when she threw her hands right up. Again, part of that sequence that I shot so sure showed you earlier by Samuel Beckett, no relation, um, and now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and easy to see online. Uh, Rupert Caravan, very famous for his rather esoteric furniture. Our nouveau sculptor from Strasbourg tries to capture a different movement. And again, the flowing nature of her dress. More demure, Agathon Leonard, scarf dancer. Again, sort of emphasizing that this now is a popular after dinner entertainment. Uh, young girls would perform it um, with scarves and it really takes off. Uh, one of the earliest films we have is of Arabella performing the skirt or scarf dance. So this was part of a series designed by Agathon Leonard for Sèvres. It was also produced in bronze. The bulb goes underneath the scarf. And this is known as the tragic pose. She's fixing her sandal. It was one of a very large group. This is it in the original porcelain. It's secured for Sèvres the top prize at Paris 1900. Believe it or not, it's a table center. So you have a figure in the middle raised up on a podium, um, piping, and then you arrange your dancing figures around. And again, it's immensely popular. Loewy also appears to understand the nuances of contemporary popular culture. So here she is photographed by Benjamin Falk. And you can see here she's drawn the dress right up over her head. This is also captured again in a contemporary poster. And the poster actually appeared in an amazing exhibition held in Paris about Tanagra figures. It was at this point. I thought, well, that's interesting. They're making a link in, you know, in France uh, between Loewy and the dancers of the ancient Hellenistic world, the Tanagra. And I thought this might be a, an interesting new way of looking at Wilde's conception of Salome, because he was very interested in Tanagra. So Tanagra is a place in Greece, in what was Boeotia. Um, it was discovered in the early 1870s. Uh, tomb robbing uh, produces over 10,000 figures. Some tombs have only two or three figures, others have as many as 50. 
And one of the most famous figures that was actually discovered, in fact, pre the discovery of Tanagra, this figure was found in Athens, is the dance Tito. And it was discovered in the 1840s. It takes its name from the architect artist Tito, who found her. And she's not acquired by the Louvre until 1891, but she's very well known because she sits in an artist's studio. The sketch of her um, is by Degas and dates to 1857-59. There's a couple of sketches of her by Degas. They're in the British Museum if you want to have a look at them. And uh, the dance uh, Tito, rep well, the, the figure represents the mantle dance. Now, we're not quite sure what mantle dancers did, to be quite honest. There's lots of uh, uh, sort of suppositions that these dances were performed as some sort of ritual, religious, to celebrate a new season. Some have suggested the mantle dancers celebrated weddings, or uh, another is because they're wearing the hymation over their head, that they're celebrating the coming of winter. But the important thing is that they are known as mantle dancers, and even more importantly, veiled dancers. So the Degas drawing is actually simply entitled The Veiled Dancer. And the veiled dancer, the dance Tito, you know, she takes off, she's ubiquitous again, rather like Louis Fuller. Here she is magnified to almost life size by Joseph von Kopf. And this is in the Hermitage. And this was reproduced to go on your mantelpiece, you could get it in Marion, porcelain, you name it, in terracotta, you could get a copy a reproduction of the veil dancer and as you can see she's very sexy with the sort of her physique showing uh, through the diaphanous robes but notice again the hymation over her head and sometimes the hymation comes right down and virtually covers her face so this is Robert Fowler he's obviously a poor man's Albert Moore very famous aesthetic painter this Wilde could easily have seen this. It was shown at the Royal Academy in 1885. And most importantly here, the dance of Salome has become Roman. Um, is this a Tanagra figure? It's incredibly like, as you can see, uh, the dance Tito or the veiled dancer, including her diaphanous veil. And uh, the, the whole sort of setting is typical of the aesthetic movement, a correlation between form and color. And then there is Jerome's Tanagra, takes the artistic world by storm in 1890 when she's first exhibited. Um, it's a polychromatic work, uh, and particularly, this is one of the things that Tanagra brought um, a new dimension because they are coloured. Um, you know, the terracotta body was uh, coloured first of all, first of all, covered in a white slip, and then the figures are painted. Uh, a blue is dominant. So here we can see all the figures coming out of the ground, the pickaxe, this is Tanagra, and then the figure that he created, the hoop dancer, is being held on her hand. And the hoop dancer, a dancer, again, please note, um, was entirely Jerome's invention. So these are all things that mention this figure by Jerome, everybody knew about, Wild again could not avoid it. So the fact that you have a dancer and all these veils, and this is a little later by Edward Pointer, but you can see here how the veil dancer could easily become Roman, or I should really say Hellenistic. And we know that Wilde had Tanagra figures. He actually acquired them on his trip to Greece with uh, Maffe. He, he re refer references them quite a few times in uh, various contexts. And by the way, Maffe writes about them quite extensively in his own a record of his trips uh, to Greece. So this is one of the areas that I'm exploring is Wild and Tanagra. And this is another work by Pointer, again, a, a bit, bit too late to be a, a prequel, but it's, it's 1895. This is called the Ionian Dance. And, uh, but it does have a sort of prequel through Lord Lytton, who in 1872 had done a sort of reworking of the odes and epods of uh, Horace, epodes, I should probably pronounce that, of Horace. And so I love the, again, the, um, the, the, the reworking, the ripening virgin, blushless, leans delighted, I, I, iconic, ionic dances, as in Ionian, in the art of wantons, studiously fashioned, even in the bud tingles within her, mediated sin. It's that idea that even the ingenue, she knows that she's got the power to bewitch men. And Pointer was so pleased with this that he reprised it again in the inevitably labelled skirt dance 
1895. I've yet to actually find an image of that. So here's a close-up of it. You can see again the diaphanous character of her dress and the Roman matrons behind. Again, it's supposed to be sort of Pompeian era, first century AD, and it's tinged with all that decadence of the Romans. I love her. So you can see how all of this comes to a head in 1895 uh, with Loe Fuller adopting or attempting to bring to life Salome on the stage. She was, she was better off being a, a sort of abstract Salome and she would become known eventually as the Salome Moderne, again because of the dress and the light show. Uh, the, she, the audience didn't enjoy her miming. And as you can see here from a, this is a contemporary academic writing about her, lost that aura of unreality, ineffability and mystery. She was just, you know, clobbing, uh, clomping around the stage and didn't keep her plump, rather sweaty figure um, out of the uh, scenario. Uh, so the first official, no, we, sorry, the first official Salome a la Wilde's play uh, is Lena Munter here in the role uh, 1896, doing some bodybuilding, as you can see. But everybody will have a go at being a modern Salome, and I couldn't resist putting in Marta Hari's version. Um, she was most famous for dancing a sort of um, uh, Siamese, as in Siam, uh, uh, dance with the uh, amazing costumes. I mean, she virtually appeared with nothing on uh, but her jewels, and famously, of course, will be executed as a spy in 1917. She's actually Dutch, by the way, in terms of her origin. So here's Marta Hari in the guise of Salome. And a lot of this um, development after 1904, in terms of the Salomania, um, is down, of course, to the opera, which rather strips out all the homoerotic elements that Wilde surreptitiously hides. Uh, and concentrates very much on the doomed or the tragedy, the love of, between, of course, John the Baptist and Salome. So here's the poster with Mary Garden in the lead role, more of that in a minute. And the opera is first performed in Dresden in 1905, December. It was, I think, originally designed to be launched in Vienna. They weren't too keen uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, so um, it's played first, I think, in Austria, in Graz, but if I've got that wrong, I apologize. And then we've got the Munich poster for 1910, but it had already been played in Munich before then, where she looks rather like Brunhilde, doesn't she, in terms of her, her costume. So this uh, was a very difficult role for any woman to take on the role of Salome in the opera, in the sense that you had to be able to sing and dance. So it was often a split role with one person, one woman singing and another dancing. So for the United States, the, the premier at the Met, uh, Olive Frenstad took the title role of, of Salome singing, here with John, the head of John the Baptist, and the dance was performed by Bianca Froelich. That's January 1907. But the woman who made it her own and who uh, went to Paris to learn how to dance uh, was Mary Garden. She performed Salome in the French, because as you go to think about them, the opera, there were different librettos, French, and the, the French one comes after the German. I wonder what they thought of her in Milwaukee. Here she is with, with a very sad looking head of John the Baptist on a platter and a very demure dress, as you can see. Now, um, in New York, everybody was shocked and horrified, and obviously, by the whole concept of Salome and the Dance of the Seven Veils. Didn't stop Richard, um, didn't stop uh, Henri uh, inviting, this is Robert Henri, he sounds very French, he's actually an American artist, didn't stop him inviting a Salome dancer into his studio so that he could capture the femme fatale of the moment. This is Mademoiselle Vox, Lexka, saying that slowly. Um, I have no idea who she really is. It's obviously a nom de plume. We have a, a series of these wonderful images of her in the studio. Uh, the most famous one of her, which is this one here, if I'm not, it, well, one of them is in the Ringler, which is this amazing collection um, in Florida. And uh, this is the beginning of what becomes known as Salomania. And Maud Allen obviously exemplifies it. 
Uh, her first performance is in Vienna in 1906, loosely, very loosely based, on, not so much on world play, but the dance of seven veils. And she ends up, as you can see, essentially just wearing her jewels. I've put in a, a, a Franz von Stuck in the corner, another version that he paints, because he paints as many artists do, Salome more than once. And um, you can see that even if he didn't actually have her in his studio, he may well have used images of her, because look at the similarity of the arm movements here in the Franz von Stuck painting and in the uh, carte de visite postcards, it should read the, not carte de visite, but you know, these postcards that you could get to, you know, like literally like we would collect today souvenirs. And uh, I just love her here uh, with, you know, the different, you see here again, the pose of the arm, the jewels. Believe it or not, the costumes actually survived, as you'll see in a minute. Um, uh, there's a notorious libel trial uh, over the cult of the clitoris. Uh, which I'm afraid she does a bit of a wild in the sense that she fails to win the libel trial and that will in essence uh, destroy her career, which had been up until that point very successful. Here is the um, costume which has survived and is in the Dart collection um, in Canada. She's actually born um, in Toronto and even her shoes have survived. They look remarkably Art Deco, don't, don't they, in terms of their stylization and have Beardsley-esque uh, stylization as you can see and this is the jeweled headdress that she wore. So by the time we get to 1910, Salome is everywhere on our cigarettes, uh, Maud Allen style. I love the idea that you might get corns from dancing the dance of the seven veils. Just love that idea, I'm sorry. Uh, Salome corn plasters. Um, but uh, Tanagra are equally everywhere. So this is another cigarette packet, but this time rather than Salome, we have Tanagra and it's the dance Tito, the veil dancer yet again, or the Tanzerin, as she's known in German. And here, almost at the end of my talk, we, oh, to show you that it's an industry, so I've shown you lots of photographs um, that you would buy as souvenirs, but there are also um, spin-offs. This is a, a music hall uh, song by Archibald Joyce, again, exploiting the whole concept of uh, Salome. In this case, the vision of Salome relates to another at stage production. This is Florent Schmidt's La Tragedie de Salome, um, another operatic excursion uh, of 1907. And hence you can see here uh, the vision of Salome. It all sort of cal collates into one sort of Salome experience. But the important thing is that this again inspires Noe Fuller to have another go at performing at Salome on stage. So her 1907 production is based on Florent Schmidt's The Tragedy at the Salome, not on Wild. And again, it's a total flop. Um, she's 45 now, come on. Um, I, you know, I wish us to keep going, ladies, as we age gracefully. But I think 45 Dancing Salome is pushing it a little. Here is, in fact, this is her down the bottom in a wonderful hat. But these are, you know, these are the wigs that she wore and miming that she provided. It just obviously did not work. This is what they wanted. They wanted Loewy, ethereal, translucent, coloured movements, flying around the stage, metamorphosizing. They didn't want this sort of right ridiculous pantomime uh, that went on. And so I'm afraid uh, Salome and Loewy Fuller do not create a course célèbre in 1907. So I'm hoping that you've enjoyed my links between Oscar Wilde, Beardsley's Salome, and then moving into the idea of the Dance of the Seven Veils taking on a life of its own, performed obviously by Loewy Fuller first in 1895, but then by many others, but most famously uh, by Maud Allen. So that it becomes, up to the First World War, Salomania, a concept that I love. Loewy's story, I think, is a fascinating one, and she has largely fallen out of the historical record. Uh, except if you want a bit of fun, you can finish up my talk by going onto YouTube and watching Taylor Swift's homage 
to Lowy Fuller in 2019. But I'm going to leave you with my last film clip of Lowy Fuller. And you're probably going to wonder why when you see this, how on earth she ever acquired such notoriety as it does look rather amusing. But if I'd had more time, we could have gone into Lowy Fuller in film. She, she was always keen to innovate some of the earliest films uh, she's involved with. And uh, she's very much, I think, for me, an embodiment of all that Art Nouveau represents, this quest for representation of the modern world. And here it all comes together. Loewe is dancing in her amazing dress, the light show, and the new technology of film. I really hope that I've opened your eyes, not only to Loewe Fuller, but to the way in which she's even come into modern culture in that amazing Estonian entry for the Eurovision Song Contest. Bye for now.